said, I don't know, Daddy, like a basketball player, what all the rest of the kids wrote. He said, well, put that on the paper. Take that to school tomorrow and give it to him. Take your paper and put it in your drawer. Every morning when you get up, read your paper. And every night before you go to bed, read your paper. That's your paper. What he told me was a principle of success, that if you write it down, and envision it. Anything you see in your mind, you can hold in your hand. He knew that. And so he gave that to me. Whatever you do, don't let life change you. But somebody in this place has gone through some tough times and some dark days, has been through some things. When all of this is over, you're going to come out stronger than you are, than you ever have been in your life. Don't panic. Don't faint. It's just a test. And I, I say this to people all the time. It isn't me. It's you. And sure, you may have grabbed some little foothold from the podcast or from one of the books, but it isn't me that changes you. It's you. You set the small goals. You achieve those goals. Then set some more and achieve those and set some more goals, maybe a little bit bigger, but not that much bigger. We pay attention to the progress. Just start. Start small. Start with changing tomorrow morning. Just tomorrow morning. Get that squared away. And then move on to the next day and the next and move your life to a better place one little step one little victory at a time you should dream outlandish dreams if it's in your imagination it's possible do you know that you can't think of something that can't happen you know it's impossible to think of the impossible it's not possible so if you think it, it's possible and if you live your life in possibilities instead of probabilities, you have a greater chance of finding happiness. Seriously, never live your life in probability. Probability is the probability of something happening. There's a statistic attached to a probability. One in every 3,000 people do this. One in every... That's a probability. A possibility has no stats attached to it. Live your life in possibilities and you're changing. Just change the way you think. It's not what you do for a living. It ain't how much you make. It ain't none of that. It's simply how you think. If you change your thought, you change everything. You change your attitude. You change your altitude. It's all that is the law of attraction. It takes a lot of courage to allow yourself to grow in the face of scrutiny. See, see. Everybody grows, men, women, faith, bishops, everybody grows. But generally you grow in privacy and your struggles are kept private and you develop and you mm. grow out of it. Hopefully you get out of it before anybody man shoots you down. Mm. And it takes a lot of courage to, to say I'm not there yet. And what I have had the courage over you is to say, I don't know everything. I've been willing to change. I've been willing to evolve. I've been willing to explain myself to people that I didn't even have to respond to. Because in the process of doing that, people begin to understand that you are not who they think you are. If you want the future to change for you, you've got to change. If you don't change, the next six years of your life is gonna be just like the last six. You'll still be behind on your bills. You'll still be behind on your promises. If you will get better, everything will get better for you. What a clear message that was for me. If you'll change your philosophy, you'll change your habits. If you'll change and accept some new disciplines, if you'll turn the corner where you've been in the past, go for a new life for the future, all kinds of remarkable things will happen to you if you will change. And so most people think their life is dictated by external circumstances. They spend their entire life trying to control what is outside of them. And the fact of the matter is you cannot always control the external factors that are impacting you in your life. The good news is it's the external things in your life that do not dictate the direction or the ultimate destination of your life. 
That is a fallacy. Listen to me when I tell you this. External circumstances do not dictate the ultimate destination of your life. It's an internal game. You and your faith, your God, are what will control the direction of your life, not the external things that are impacting you all the time. And this identity is that internal thermostat. It sets the temperature, just like a thermostat sitting on the wall, of the conditions of your entire life. I've been challenged by other people. I've had other people uh, put the mountain in front of me and say, Maxwell, go climb that. And, and I can tell you right now, I've taken that challenge sometimes and climbed that mountain and felt that I accomplished something great. But let me tell you something about other people's challenges. I may go do that or try to do that, but that may not be where I need to put my time, effort, and energy. Instead of letting other people challenge you, challenge yourself. You know your strengths. You know your dreams. You know your heart. So why don't you sit down and reflect for a moment and ask yourself, what do I really want to accomplish that I haven't accomplished yet? I mean, get on your agenda. Get in your area, in your space, and say, I need to challenge me. When you challenge yourself, you're challenging yourself in an area that is close to your heart, and it's who you are. In other words, the closest way to meet a challenge with a great sense of authenticity is to challenge you. Before I met Mr. Shoup, I used to cross my fingers and say, I sure hope things will change. I was hoping the government would change and the tax structure would change and that my boss would change and pay me more money. Uh, I was hoping that, you know, economics would change and prices would come down. And I was hoping that circumstances would get better. And then I discovered from my teacher that those things are going to continue the same. In fact, all of those things that happen to us is kind of like the wind that blows. And the wind blows on us all. But if you just let the wind blow, I'm telling you, it won't take you where you want to go. All of us must use this wind to take us to the dreams we've got, to the equity we want, to the money we want, to the income we want, and to all the things we want our life to have. This is where we want to go, and we've got a good wind, but we must not leave our future just to the wind, just to the economy, uh, just to the structure of the way things are happening today. Too often in life, people don't work on changing their identity. They're always working on producing external results. Have you ever known somebody who was wealthy and no longer is? Have you ever known somebody who made a bunch of money and no longer does? How about somebody who was in a great relationship and that relationship no longer exists? How about someone who got in great shape that is no longer in that shape again? If your results begin to exceed your internal thermostat, you will find a way to cool your life back down to what you believe you're worth and you're comfortable at your identity. You'll think it's coincidental. Oh, I was this accident happened or this appointment canceled. Or, it's not coincidence. All of those things have happened because you set the thermostat of your life and you've regulated what you're going to get. Isn't that incredible? That you can learn all the talents, the behaviors, the skills, the tactics, all the strategies. But if you don't alter that thermostat internally, you could have all of the skills of a 100 degree producer and you will live a 75 degree existence because you will turn the air conditioner of your life on back down to cool it where you're comfortable. It's also true, by the way, You've seen this in your own life. Maybe you've had something really good going in business before. You've got momentum. It seems like things are happening great. And then you wake up four, five, six months later and you've cooled your life, your business, right back down to where it was before. It's not coincidental. You've cooled the conditions back down again. And so you've seen this happen. Maybe you got in great shape at one point, but your identity wasn't that fit a person. And you've cooled it back down to about what you're comfortable being. This is true in your faith and your relationships. So you've proven this, this over and over in your life, haven't you? So have I, so has every single human being. The governor on our life, the regulator of our life, is our identity, which is the internal thermostat that sets the temperature for our life. The way to find purpose is you must identify what it is that you have to be purposeful in. Right When you are struggling with what to do, who you are, what's your next move, you are in an identity crisis. 
you are struggling with just who you are. See, you have not discovered who you are. You have to discover who you are in order to move you forward. You need a goal, but we don't want to let your distance from the goal crush you. So you got to set up a goal and then you got to make the goal, break the goal down into parts so that you can move towards it and you have a fairly high likelihood of doing it. So that, that's a bit, bit of practical, I wouldn't say advice, it's, it's, because it's better than advice. It's, it's some practical knowledge about how to go about achieving an aim. Set a high aim, but differentiate it down so you know what the next step is. And then make the next step difficult enough so you have to push yourself past where you are, but, but also provide yourself with a reasonable probability of success. It's also what you do with children, right? You, you want to push them because they need to grow up and be more than they are, right? But you don't want to crush them with constant failure. So what you do is aim high and make the goal prox difficult but proximate. Who do you know that you can compare yourself to? That's easy. You. Yesterday. So here's a good goal. It's something like, well, aim high. And I, I really mean that. It's like, aim high, but use as your control yourself. It's like, so your goal is to make today some tiny increment better than yesterday. And you can use better, you can define better yourself. This doesn't have to be some imposition of external morality. You know, you know where you're weak and insufficient, where you could improve. Think, okay, well, this is what I'm like yesterday. If I did this little thing, things would be just a, an increment better. And, well, that's a great thing because you get the ball rolling and incremental improvement is unstoppable. You can actually implement it, and it starts to generate Pareto distribution-like consequences. It starts to compound. The goal should be, how could I conceive of my life so that if I had that life, it would clearly be worth living, so I wouldn't have to be bitter, resentful, deceitful, arrogant, and vengeful. Like, that's sort of the bottom line, right? Because that's what endless failure does to you. It's not good. And, and, and... That's what life without purpose and a goal does to you as well, because life is very hard. So you think, okay, well, I need to adopt a mode of being that would justify my suffering. And you can ask yourself that question. What would make this worthwhile? Nietzsche, I quote Nietzsche, I think, in that chapter. He said, he who has a why can bear almost any how. That's a lovely line, man. I mean, it's a lovely line. And it's really worth thinking about. So you think, well... How, how do I manage all this misery and suffering and futility? It's like, well, I need to figure out what I would have to do in order to make that clearly worthwhile. And so then you have your goal and then you think, well, I need to move towards that incrementally because I'm kind of useless and can only do so much and maybe not even that. And, but all I have to do is be a little bit better than my, my miserable self yesterday. And that'll propel you forward very rapidly and, and you can succeed at it, which is also really lovely. So mistakes are going to happen. Make a million mistakes. Just quit wasting your energy making the same mistakes. You have to make a decision that I will learn from this thing. I've just, I've just, I've just, I've resolved in my spirit, in my heart, that every experience is my education. Experiences is education. So the good experiences and the bad experiences, I'm going to learn from that and I'm going to discover the opportunity for me to grow and for me to get better. I'm telling you, I've already made up my mind that I know I will fall down. I know that I will stumble, but I already see myself getting back up. Therefore, I'm never down. I'm either up or getting back up. Can I get a witness at 6 p.m. tonight who's decided I'm going to learn? You're going to learn today. See, we, we buy and want to listen to what we think is going to get us what we want really quick. But the things that we really need, which is stuff on spiritual maturity and stuff that will really help us grow up. That's not the kind of things that people want. If I stand up and say tonight, I'm going to preach on how to get your miracle. I mean, whoa, 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 whoa. If I say tonight I'm going to teach on discipline and self-control, come on, you ought, to, you ought to have the job of doing this and see the looks you get sometimes when you're trying to teach people things that they need. You know, it, it's like trying to 
feed a kid spinach. It's like... <laughs> My kids, when they were little, I remember they loved the smashed up Gerber peaches. You know, little baby food in jars, peaches. And I liked them too, so I'd give them a bite and then I'd take a bite. <laughs> but you know, if you're a good parent, then you start slipping in a spoonful of carrots or a spoonful of spinach. And those aren't so good because they don't, they don't do much to hide the nasty taste. And so, you train them to the point where they think peaches are coming, they go mm. <laughs> And then you throw in a spoonful of spinach and they go mm. And I know when you guys are spitting back out what I'm trying to give you. So I give you a little bit of peaches. Tell you how great you are, how wonderful you are. Then when you least expect it, here comes a spoonful of spinach. And here's the thing, I'm a good mama, so you can go all you want to, but I'll scrape it up off your chin and keep putting it back in your mouth. If I only get one spoonful of spinach in you today, it's worth it because you're not going to grow up and survive and be strong in the Lord on dessert all the time. So we have to tell you more than just you're wonderful, you're anointed, God loves you, he's got a good plan for your life. We have to also slip in there, it's time to grow up, it's time to mature, it's time to stop making excuses, it's time to stop blaming everybody else. Come on. And so you need to go home and you need to take your time <laughs> And you need to diligently study the Word of God in the area where you're having a problem. There's power inherent in the Word of God to do the work in us that needs to be done if we will go to the Word and study it and meditate on it, not trying to change yourself, but trusting the Word of God to do that work in you and spending time with God. And it doesn't really matter to me what you do when you spend time with God. You can sit there and stare out the window for all I care. But the point is, is you say to God, you're the only one that can help me. I cannot change myself. I cannot help myself. But I believe there's power in your word, so I'm going to study your word, I'm going to meditate on your word, and I am going to sit here in your presence and trust that whether I feel anything or I don't feel anything, that you are working in me and you are changing me. Now, I don't know how to make it any simpler than that. Take your medicine, the word of God, which is medicine for your soul. Study in the area where you're having a problem. I mean, if you're having a problem forgiving somebody, then don't just try to forgive them. Study every scripture you can find on forgiving your enemies and study them and read them and write them out in longhand and look up the definitions of them and meditate on those scriptures and before long you'll start finding that you can do it. And I, let me say it again, it's not going to happen just by trying. We make an effort, but it's an effort made in and with the Holy Spirit. It's not self-effort but it's leaning on God. Apart from me, Jesus said, you can do nothing. So, works of the flesh are works of the law, which is what Galatians is talking about, are works that don't work. <laughs> They're our energy trying to do what only God can do. Let me say it again, you have a part God has a part, you cannot do his part, he will not do your part. One more time. Your partner's with God, you have a part, 
He had every victory that comes in your life, you will have a part in it. It may even be that God will tell you in this battle, I want you to do absolutely nothing but be patient and wait on me. Maybe you'll be in a battle and God will tell you, I want you to fast for three days and spend that time praying. Or maybe God will tell you, I want you to sow a special seed, a special offering. Whatever God shows you to do, do it. But don't just come up with your own plans. And I alluded to this this morning or last night, but I had such problems with my mouth. And I, I so distinctly remember when I started hearing messages about the power of words. I mean, I knew I was in big trouble. How I many of you say really stupid things? And so I wanted to change. I, I wanted to not get in trouble with my mouth. But a fleshly plan is always one that's way out of balance, it's not going to work. And so my plan to not get in trouble with my mouth was to say nothing. Well, I'm just, I'm just, I'm not going to say anything tomorrow. Nothing. Does anybody know what I'm talking about? You're just like, I'm, I'm just going to be quiet, I'm not going to say anything. Well, first of all, if you're a big talker, I can tell you now, you ain't going to be quiet. And you're not going to go all day and not say anything. And even if you did, it wouldn't change anything because you're still talking inside. And so here's what would happen. I would, I could force myself to maybe be real quiet for a day or two, but I would start to feel depressed. And it was so confusing to me, I thought, I'm trying to do the right thing. Why is it making me feel depressed? And God said, because nothing's changing on the inside. Come on. See, that's why no matter how much you try to force yourself to do the right thing, only God can change you from the inside out. And if the inside doesn't change,